Get ready for the big revival. The real estate revival, that is. Now on 77 WABC, your New York weekend. Get ready for the big revival. It's Rand on Real Estate. Look out! With Greg Rand. Welcome to Rand on Real Estate. This is Greg Rand, your host on 77 WABC and WABCradio.com. I'm here at the Small Business Authority Studios in Midtown Manhattan with Laura Smith, my co-host. How are you? Hey, it's great to be here once again. Thank yep, you. Glad to have you. We have a great show on tap for you today. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. We're going to make sense of some conflicting headlines that you might have caught in the media in the last couple of days, and I'm going to help you parse through those things so that... You can get a sense, you know, it's very important to us here that you understand the housing market so the people who don't understand it but seem to get a lot of, a lot of ink and a lot of face time on TV, don't throw off uh, your game and blow your confidence. We're going to show you how to pick a winner today. One of the things that I specialize in is looking at this national real estate marketplace, the way that a, a hedge fund manager or a mutual fund manager might look at all the stocks on the stock exchange and pick the winners, figure out... What is the right balance, the right mix, the right kind of investment for you? And we're going to kind of zigzag around the country a bit today and show you how there is something for everybody out there in the American housing market. If you want to build wealth, if you want to be a real estate entrepreneur, we're going to talk a lot about that. We're going to have an expert on the air with us from Long Beach, California. I promise you, we'd be zigzagging across the country. So we're going to start on the West Coast. And, you know, we're here in New York. Most of our listeners are going to be here in the New York metro area. Hopefully there's a few folks out there that are listening to us on the Internet. And uh, and if you are, wherever you're calling from or wherever you're listening from, give us a call at 800-848-WABC. That's 800-848-9222. And here's the question I want you to think about and then give us a call. Where around the country would you want to look to pick a winner? You see, professional investors in real estate, they don't pick properties first. They don't run out there and see a property and decide to buy it. They first identify a market that they think is going to be on the upswing, a place where they believe over the next number of years the trending is positive. And so first they pick the geography, and then they focus on finding an ugly duckling within that marketplace. So today we're going to focus on picking winners and in the context of markets. So we're going to talk about Long Beach, but then I want you to call and let me know where you have your eyes uh, fixed. Are there any places around the country or even locally that you are thinking about or that you'd like me to analyze for you? And I'm going to show you basically a five-minute market analysis, some tools that are available to you out there on the Internet. I'll show you where to go and get them. And it's really, really fun because basically – you know, look, there's never been a better time to be a research analyst in any subject out there. With the Internet and the, the powerful tools available to you, I'll show you where to find them, and we'll show you how to go out there and do a couple of different little scratching of the surface and uncover some gold mines that are maybe hiding right there in plain sight. We're going to focus again today on the five principles of real estate wealth. I got a great response from this after the last show. You know, people... They call the show, but they also call me and email me. They go to my website, which is ownamerica.com, because I want you to own as much of America as you can. Uh, and they email me. And my email address is greg at ownamerica.com. And they like what I get into the meat and potatoes. Okay? That's the thing. The message that I'm getting from people who hear this show is give us more of the specifics, Greg. Tell us again, you know, if you, if you get to know me, what you, you check me out, you're going to find that I sort of have the Midas touch when it comes to picking winning real estate investments. And that's why I've dedicated my entire career to this because I'm not good at anything else, but I'm good at this. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're going to show you how I go about it and the five principles of real estate wealth. We're going to get on to uh, principle number four, which I, I'm going to tease you with right now. Uh, and I'll get back into that in some more detail in a couple of minutes. Um, so it's going to be a fun hour. We're going to uh, take a lot of calls. We're going to answer your questions. And hopefully what we're going to do is kind of light your candle a little bit here. You know, we've all gotten just abused um, by this recession and this housing crisis over the last couple of years, and it just keeps seeming to get uglier and nastier and worse. But you see, I see past that, all this. I, I see, I know this asset class like the back of my hands, and I know that you have to look at it in 10-year chunks. You can't, if you focus, if you stare at your toes, you're never going to see the trends. And if you're staring down at your toes right now, all you see are things like the headlines this week, for example. Oh, my buddies over at Zillow.com who are mad at me right now because I went on a tirade on the blogosphere about <laughs> their press release this week. Zillow is a website that has some fantastic analytics and great national inventory of properties, a wicked iPad app, a really good um, website. 
But they have their head on sideways when it comes to analyzing uh, the housing market. And I think what I wrote on the blog was Zillow is the new Schiller. And if you listen to this show, you know that I can't stand the K. Schiller Index. I can't stand uh, – I don't want to say it too. I don't even know Dr. Robert Schiller, but I think he's a villain when it comes to the housing market because – these are people who have made a name for themselves by scaring everybody beyond the reasonable. Don't just report the numbers, but trump them up and skew all your research to make it look as bad as possible. Well, Zillow has got an IPO coming up, and Zillow took a cue from Dr. Schiller and has gotten a, a PR bonanza going on right now precisely because they have figured out ways to take their – uh, regular press releases and skew them to the negative. Case in point, maybe you caught a headline in the last couple of days that said that 28% of all households are underwater right now. Okay, It was picked up on every TV station, every newspaper. 28% of all the homeowners in America are underwater on their mortgage, meaning they owe more on the loan than the house is actually worth. Lousy place to be, no doubt about it. Two problems with that. One, it's not 28% of all homeowners. It's 28% of all homeowners with a mortgage. Sounds like a small distinction, but it's not because 30% of all homeowners don't have any mortgage at all. So it actually turns out still a big number. It's about 16 or 17% of all homeowners in general are underwater, but it's a big difference. And the catastrophic nature of convincing people that one in four of your neighbors owe more than their home is worth, they... Zillow put the press release out correct. They said 28% of people with mortgages are underwater, but nobody paid attention to that little minor detail. And they put this information out there, and they're scaring a lot of people into thinking that we've got not a correction that we're processing right now, but some kind of long-term sustained meltdown of the housing market. And I'm here to tell you that is not what's happening. In fact, we're at a place right now where we're about to find the bottom in the next year. You know, you're gonna. If you're the kind of person who wants to know what's going to happen tomorrow, you're just going to get frustrated by me, and you're going to get frustrated by this show because I keep talking about like now is 2011, 2012. That's now. Real estate moves kind of in geological time. Everything moves slowly. It's a big, slow moving ship, and if you want to turn it, it's not going to happen overnight. If you look past the next two years, what you can see is the market, when it bottoms out, is going to sit there for a while. Okay, after a period of volatility like we've had for the last couple of years, it just takes a deep breath, the housing market, and it quiets down. Same thing happened at the end of the 1980s. We had a run-up in prices. We had a big, ugly correction at the end of the decade. We had a big bank bailout. We had a big stock market crash. All those things. Then, after the market settled, it just sat there for the better part of the 1990s, and it didn't budge. But if you waited the full decade, then you saw the revival at the end of the tunnel there. So that's where we are right now. When you hear people talking about how the housing market's in the tank, the answer is yes, it is. Okay, so what's your plan? My plan is to buy real estate while it's in the tank because maybe you've heard the term buy low, sell high, right? That's kind of a common phrase. People understand that. But I have to ask you, what do you think it feels like to buy low? This is what it feels like. It's lonely and it's scary and you might be the only person doing it, but when everybody looks back in 10 years and sees the kind of wisdom and courage and fortitude that you showed when everybody knew the market was at the bottom, but they were too chicken to do anything about it. We're here to encourage you that if you have the wherewithal, we're going to show you how to do it right, and we're going to try to get you to get off the sidelines and make a decision that could be a life changer for you. It's not going to change your life tomorrow, but it's darn well going to change your life in 10 years when you've built wealth. I'm all about creating real estate millionaires here. That's, that's my dream. Okay, I want to create a million millionaires on the other end of this housing crisis. So give us a call, 800 800- Eight four eight nine two two two. Tell us what market you've got your eye on. Visit me at ownamerica.com. Email me at greg at ownamerica.com. And let's figure out a way to get you to put your money to work and create financial abundance for your future. You're listening to Rand on Real Estate on 77 WABC. Back in two minutes. Welcome back to Rand on Real Estate. My name is Greg Rand. I'm your host on 77 WABC and wabcradio.com. We're here talking about building wealth in real estate, and we have a call from James in New Jersey who's interested in Hawaii. How are you doing, James? Hey, great. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for calling, and thanks for picking a market so far away, because that's part of the fun here is to kind of zigzag across the globe. Now, w- tell me about Hawaii. You have interest in there in general. Have you been there? Yes, sir, I have. And I've what are you thinking the, about? Oh, uh, I've been to the Big Island, and uh, you know, I had just bought a house a week before I had went, not really, not realizing how affordable real estate was on the Big Island. And, 
I was just wondering what your opinion would be over the next two years, uh, whether it be vacant land or you know real you know real estate with ha- with a house on it. Um, you know what that would look like within the next couple of years if it was worth doing. Um, I guess specific information that you would need for that is my credit's not great, but um, I have a private mortgage um, with my family, so. Uh, my okay, money so let me start. Is not as uh, strictly expected by a bank or anything like that. All right, good. So you have some capital backing you up. Let me start from the very top here. I mentioned in the first segment that we've got an approach here that professional investors use to first identify a market that they think has upside. And so the first thing that I did. It's funny because in the first segment, I was kind of beating on Zillow's uh, economics department, but then I went to their website because they have some pretty cool tools here that if you go to Zillow.com and you go to the tab on the top that says local info, and then under local info, you can put any state, any zip code, any city in the country, but there's two things that are important. One, you want to change the index to show you 10 years. Zillow, as is their bent, always wants to focus on short-term analysis. And so they missed the big picture, but they have the ability, if you change the settings, to look at 10 years. I'm looking right now at a 10-year chart of the state of Hawaii, and what's interesting about it is that basically that market went absolutely haywire from the beginning of, you know, 10 years ago, from 2001 all the way until 2007. It went from a median sale price, and this is the entire state, of just above 200 grand to a median sale price of uh, just above 450. That's so it. the market more than doubled over that period, but that's not so unusual, right? You have a lot of places around the country that saw uh, meteoric appreciation during the boom and then gave it all back. Not the case in Hawaii. The chart then shows that Hawaii basically came down after the quote unquote bust that everybody keeps talking about from 450 to 350, and that's where it stays right now. It's actually hovering a little bit above four hundred thousand dollars as a median price right now. So what does that tell us? Okay, number one, it tells us that. Something about that state has defied the market correction. Okay, the prices doubled. They didn't triple, but they doubled during the first part of the boom, and then they stayed there. So the next question that I would have is, what's happening in Hawaii? We we know it's a beautiful place. We know that it's world-renowned. People want to go there. But what's happening that could be making it so recession-proof? Because, again, normally there are places that I could show you, like Memphis, Tennessee, or Houston, Texas, that have incredibly stable real estate, but it's stable on both sides of the coin, right? They didn't see a boom, so they don't have a big major hangover either. Here they saw sure. the boom, but there's no hangover. You know, I don't know. Is that like, it's, it's like job. high-grade tequila, right? You, you, know, you, you have a party, but you don't have a hangover. So the next I place... It's jobs, my friend. It's there's jobs. No jobs out there. What do you know about that you can tell us? Well... Uh, I know that there's basically jobs in the military out there where they were building a base, so that definitely accounts for part of the boom out there. Myself, I'm going to be a teacher. Um, I don't know how great it's going to be, so I don't want to take a big risk. I was thinking of just buying some vacant land and watching my uh, investment grow and then build a house on it after I finish my Ph.D., you know, well, here's the only the only downside of vacant land is that it won't generate any cash flow. If you if you buy it with cash, and you can sit on it, all you can be paying is the taxes, and you don't have much to maintain because it's vacant dirt. And so, in those kind of situations, vacant land can be okay, but you're not going to do anything but see appreciation when you buy. And this is something you have to evaluate for yourself. And we can talk after the radio show to get into more detail about what your plans are. But, of course, if you've got an improved piece of property, meaning there's a building on it, a house on it, you can generate rental income. And if you're paying cash for that, that's all income to you. If you have a mortgage, you want to try to see if you can have positive cash flow from it. But that's the, the equation there. How much money you're working with? Let's say, for example, you're working with 100 grand, just out of thin air, okay? 100 okay. grand, and you could buy vacant land with 100 grand and have no mortgage at all. Or you could buy a house for 200 grand and, and have half of it be a mortgage. The question is going to be how much rent can you get? from those tenants, and will it give you a positive cash flow each month? If that's the case, the house is probably the better bet because, A, you have some leverage working for you. Every point of appreciation is, a, is based upon only having put half of, the, of the, uh, the down payment down, not buying it in cash, so you see a greater return on investment that way. But I want to jump to something else. I want to give you guys another tip. And by the way, everything that I'm sharing with you, you can find at ownamerica.com. We have a research tools tab on the homepage. And there's a website at Forbes.com. Forbes has created a, a map of the U.S. You can click on any county in the U.S., and it will show you graphically the migration patterns. 
And what I'm looking at right now is the state of Hawaii has got a massive inbound migration coming in from California. So that immediately tells me that, A, I know Californians are pretty comfortable with Hawaii because it's off their coast and they do a lot of vacationing out there. But any place that's drawing population out of California, a lot of that is because companies are leaving California. People are leaving California because the taxes are too heavy, and they didn't do anything about that in the last election. A lot of states like New York made some major changes, New Jersey as well. Uh, where they elected governors who ran on the platform of getting the government spending under control. That didn't happen in California. And so California is going to probably be the last state in the union that gets their arms around this problem if they ever do. And that means that for the foreseeable future, whatever reasons there are, people are leaving the gorgeous state of California to go to the gorgeous state of Hawaii. That's very likely to continue. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, I, I don't have much more time for this part of the call, but I really appreciate it, James. I hope this was helpful to you. I think you picked yourself a winner. Um, making sure that you do it in a way that you can afford and do it smart is the most important thing. If you want to email me, send me a note at greg at ownamerica.com. We can talk in more detail about your personal situation. Thank, Thank you very you much sir. for the call. Okay, so we have a couple minutes left, and we'll start. We'll do the first half of our conversation with Joe Mendez from Long Beach, California. Hey, Joe, you on the air? Yeah, I am. Hi, Greg. How you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. Good, good. Thanks for waiting and holding on with us here. So you've heard a little bit of what we're doing here, and uh, just to introduce Joe, Joe is a real estate professional in Long Beach, California, that is part of the Own American Network. One of the things that Own America does is we are gathering together a national network of like-minded real estate professionals who want to bring this message out to their client base and help people create wealth on the other side of this economic crisis. And, uh, and Joe has done a beautiful job out there in Long Beach, and basically he's seeing some things, and, and we're going to sort of talk about Long Beach in the same way we just talked about Hawaii, what's going on on the ground there that makes it a great investment market. So, Joe, tell us a little bit about, you know, you're, you have a lot of activity right now with investors. What is in their heads right now? Well, I think a lot of investors right now are definitely looking for, for value, of course, and they're they're dropping, trying to find a place to drop their money. And what I find in Long Beach is that there's definitely a, an abundance of investors with cash who are looking to put money into real estate because either they're going to flip property, which is certainly not what I would do, but they may also want to just put money somewhere so that it'll increase in value over like in in the period of 10 years, for example. So now Long Beach is situated right in between Los Angeles and, and uh, Orange County. So it's, is it actually in L.A. County? It is in L.A. County. Actually, Long Beach is, uh, I like to say it's a large city within a large city because it's actually centrally located to all of Southern California. But at the same time, it's also within the L.A. County. Uh, it's one of the most affordable uh, areas within the L.A. County uh, system. Well, that's what I'm seeing here also. I went over to Zillow again, and I punched up the numbers here. Um, and what what I see here on Long Beach is that the the entire city of Long Beach started out the ten year cycle at a median price of about two hundred thousand dollars, peaked at a median price of about four fifty, and then came down to today something around three forty. And so if you ignore if you basically take this thing in one ten year chunk, what you're talking about is about a sixty six percent appreciation over ten years, which is not so bad, especially given the fact that. Everyone's talking about California as being in meltdown zone, right? You hear about it in the news that California is one of the big foreclosure states, and yet, and I'm sure that's true, we'll talk about that in a minute, but yet it's still holding the value. But downtown, tell me about downtown Long Beach, because downtown Long Beach has seen a bigger spike and a bigger decline in prices. What's happening there? Well, I think, you know, in Long Beach, I think you have, you know, you have mixed properties. You know, you've got a whole lot of development that has taken place in Long Beach on the, on the ocean side. And then you've also got neighborhoods that are um, a little further up, which are mixed, and you know, you've had some growths there, and you've got some good buys down there. So did you guys have an overdevelopment problem, like you ended up with a, a bunch of uh, un, yeah, they, unsold yeah, they units? Built, they built a lot of uh, high-rises in downtown Long Beach. Okay. And uh, a few years ago, they were selling up in the 800, 900 range, and now they're going for two and a quarter, 250. Wow. Uh, the unfortunate part is that those condominiums, which are very nice, and again, this oceanfront property, they come with a very high HOA, like 800 or 900. So, so monthly homeowners association fees, exactly. that'll kill you, right. right. Well, that's interesting. So I, again, I'm looking at this chart, and you just explained why downtown Long Beach had a median price of 130 10 years ago, peaked at 700, <laughs> and now it's down to 200. So 
we've talked a lot of, on this show about the idea that when you see overdevelopment, what you're basically seeing is uh, artificially high supply, okay? And that artificially high supply winds up creating a, 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 an imbalance in supply and demand. Hey, Joe, hang on one second. We're going to go to a break, and I want to stay with you and finish this up in a couple of seconds. Okay. You'll listen to Randon Real Estate, 77 WABC, back in a minute. Welcome back to Rand on Real Estate. I'm Greg Rand on 77 WABC. How you doing, Laura Smith? Oh, good to be here as always. Same here. Hey, we have another call here from Bill on Staten Island asking about Phoenix. And we're going to go to Bill in one second, and we're going to have Joe Mendez from um, Long Beach just to hang on another moment for us. Remember, if you've got a question about a market someplace, either here or elsewhere, call me up. Let's do a little bit of research on it and give you an idea of how to go about this. This is a lot of fun. It's fun for me. I hope it's fun for you. So let's go to Bill on Staten Island. How you doing, Bill? Hello, Greg. This is Bill. Um, I'm thinking, not definitely Phoenix, but I'm looking for a cheap area like Phoenix because I want to buy some rental real estate, but I can't afford to do it here in New York or Brooklyn. Well, that's, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's one of the reasons why I'm sitting here in, in midtown Manhattan talking about these markets around the country. One of the reasons is this is one of the most expensive places in the solar system to buy real estate. And if you want to generate positive cash flow, it is a little trickier around here than it is in other places. So Phoenix is an interesting example. I'm looking at the 10-year chart of Phoenix right now, and I would think, if you didn't tell me otherwise, that I was looking at the Liberty Bell, okay? Picture the Liberty Bell. 2000, 2001, it shot straight up. It crested, and it shot all the way back down again, and literally, home prices in Phoenix are below, just a little bit, but below where they were 10 years ago. So why, okay? Same thing we talked about with other markets where there was too much development. The developers and the lenders and the speculators went haywire. They lost their heads in Phoenix, and the reasons why they did is that every objective analysis of the Phoenix market tells you that long-term, Phoenix has got an awesome future. Okay, it's pulling people. Like I bounce over here to that migration map that I told you about. Again, all these things are available at ownamerica.com. But the Forbes migration map, what I see is that Phoenix has been drawing people from New York, Boston, uh, let's see, Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego, pulling them in like a vacuum. All right. Now it's losing people. There's outbound, mig- outbound migration going to places like the Carolinas and Texas and the Pacific Northwest. And I know why that is, because those are the places where the jobs have been migrating to, not just Phoenix, but other places. So people who went to Phoenix a few years ago for the vibrant economy, when the economy didn't go so well, they moved off someplace else to another vibrant economy. Very, very transient city. But the big picture here is that prices, th- the entire bubble – has been erased. It's just been popped, okay? There's no there's no likelihood at all that Phoenix real estate is going to go very much further down, maybe a tiny, tiny bit just because of the artificial impact of foreclosures in that market pushing prices down. But I would sit here and tell you that is an overcorrection of Phoenix real estate prices. It is below the trend line. There's no good reason that real estate in 2011 should be cheaper than real estate in 2001 in this country. And if it is, it's because of something isolated, something explainable, but something temporary that once it's gone, it's gone. So I love Phoenix because it's a great American city that's in distress right now. And that's what you look for. Professional investors look for great places with short-term problems. All right. Well, thanks for the information. You got any other place in the country that might be affordable and good place to invest? You know what? There's a couple of others that I could throw out to you, like South Florida. Florida's got the same kind of thing going on where too much development, too much bad behavior by speculators and lenders has caused a firestorm of foreclosures and uh, negative activity in the market. But the migration patterns coming from the northeast down to Florida are unmistakably stable and permanent. I mean, 72 million baby boomers, most of which living in the Northeast, most of them are going down to Florida. But I look at the screen I'm staring at right now, and a whole heck of a lot of them are going to Phoenix also. So that's how I want you to go about this. Before you start going and scrapping around looking at properties, pick yourself a market that you can feel confident that because of population trends, job growth trends, remember, every human being that lives in that area is going to want to live with a roof over their head, and that represents demand for uh, for renting your property in the short term, midterm, and then later on when you want to sell it, folks that want to buy it and become homeowners in that market. So thank you, Bill. Great question. Great market to be analyzing. I hope you found this helpful. All right, let's go back over. Joe Mendez, you still on the line with me? 
I am. All right, man. Thanks for being patient. I appreciate it. So back over to the West Coast again, the extreme West Coast. One of the things about Long Beach that makes it obvious for anybody listening is that it's a beach, right? You guys are on the Pacific Ocean. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. All right. And that's one of the things, you know, the, the investment properties that you're selling. I know you've got a couple of properties that you've been moving recently that are like under 200 grand, even even closer to 100 grand. That's correct, yeah. So give give me a profile of a property that you've recently sold or are selling right now. Well, uh, you know, there's a property uh, in North Long Beach, for example, that's uh, listed at 188. And um I think, you know, looking at it myself, it's it basically just needs paint, just cosmetic work. And, you know, over the span of 10 years, I think that property will certainly increase in value significantly. And so the rental market for, the, that's a single-family home? It's a single-family home, two-bedroom, one-bath, uh, about 1,100 square feet possibly. And I think you could probably rent for maybe 1,500. And that would cover the mortgage if you put down 30%. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Now that's interesting. So 188. How far from the from the beach is that? Well, that's probably uh, it's again that's North Long Beach. So you're looking probably about uh, five miles. Okay, five. To you, that's a long way, Joe. To us, that sounds like it's pretty darn close. <laughs> um, now, we're talking about a, a city, a property that is maybe how many miles away from Costa Mesa, where the average price in Costa Mesa is like a half a million bucks. You're talking about uh, just a few miles away, right? We're about 35 miles. You're about 30, 30 miles. So you're sandwiched in between. To the north, you have L.A. And, and Beverly Hills and everything else. To the south, you have Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, and Costa Mesa. And right in the middle there, and you opened up saying this, is pretty much the most affordable real estate in and around the L.A. area in places where you'd want to be. That's correct. I mean, I've got a couple of clients that I'm working with now who live in LA, in other parts of L.A. County that are much desirable in terms of, uh, like, say, Mar Vista or Santa Monica and so forth. But they're, they can't afford properties in L.A. County other than Long Beach. Long Beach is their affordable point because he's in somewhere in the 275 range. So Long Beach is an affordable city. Do people in Long Beach um, commute to L.A.? Are there jobs right in Long Beach? What's the employment yeah. situation there? One of, the, one of the things about Long Beach is it used to be a, a commuter city, you know, because a lot of people would live here. There's a lot of multifamily dwellings here, single-family dwellings, condominiums, et cetera, et cetera, and they used to work in L.A., Santa Monica, the west side, you know, they just work all over, but it was a commuter city. But over the years, it's grown, you know, as you mentioned downtown earlier, it's, it's developed because it was bringing more and more development into Long Beach. So it's definitely uh, no longer that commuter city, although it still, still has that flavor. That's cool. So, so it's sort of like becoming, as you said, a city within a city, a big city within a really big city. Correct. Now, what do you say about, I mentioned earlier about the politics in, um, in this country where, you know, during this recession, the first people in this country that got our acts together and tightened our belt and learned to live on less were us, the people, right? Households stopped spending so much, started living within their means, started saving Dramatically, you know the charts that show savings rates and um, mortgage pay down rates. No one ever really talks about that, but if you dig in a little bit, what you see is Americans have decided that austerity is the new cool. Okay, and so they're they're not living outside their budgets anymore, and they're paying down debt, which makes it tougher on the economy because consumer spending fuels the economy. But it's actually a healthy thing. It's like we're getting in shape again financially as households. And you also see it in corporate America. You know, the stock market's doing great, mainly for one reason. Corporate profits are doing really well, mainly for one reason. They fired a bunch of people and cut their expenses. All right? So they learned how to trim down their expenses. I'm not trying to take any of the, you know, say anything that would denigrate the pain of being unemployed. But the point is, is that companies did it too. They said, we have to pare down our costs to match the new reality, and they did that, and they're not going to change right away. They're not going to start hiring again right away because they're enjoying the corporate profits and they're getting the job done with the workforce they have. Government is the last entity that was addicted to debt, just like everybody else was in this conversation, meaning you know, consumers, households, companies. Everyone was addicted to debt, but the households and the companies have gotten off that train. The government seems to be trying to, but we can't quite tell if California's sort of getting on board with that plan. What is your sense as a resident there about that? Well, that's a big question. I, you know, all I, all I can say is that, you know, there's, at least in my little world here in Long Beach, there's definitely a lot of opportunities for people to purchase real estate as an investment or as a first-time buyer, and that's a good place to put their money. 
Um, I know for my own self, I mean, I think I've mentioned to you before, I purchased the property through a uh, self-directed IRA, and it's actually worked out real well. I found that parking the money in, uh, in real estate, for me, in the long run, over a 10-year period, as you have outlined in your, uh, your, your work, works well for me to increase my wealth with that particular piece of property. So That's great advice. I'm really brought that up. The self-directed IRA that you can actually buy real estate with that. People don't know that. It's the best kept secret in the investing world. Joe, listen, I'm really happy you were able to join us. Thank you for being patient through the breaks and everything. This is Joe Mendez from Caldwell Banker Coastal Alliance out in, in uh, Long Beach. Joe, how do they find you? What's your website? Uh, it's Long Beach Real Estate Rainbow.com. Okay, Long Beach Real Estate Rainbow.com. Joe, thanks a million. Appreciate you having, uh, having you on the show. Thank you, Greg. Right. Okay, this is Rand on Real Estate, 77 WABC. Back in a minute. Welcome back to Rand on Real Estate. My name is Greg Rand. I'm your host on 77 WABC and WABCradio.com. My website is ownamerica.com. That's right, ownamerica.com. How awesome is that, that you can actually own a piece of the country that you love? No other country in the world has what we have, and no other country in the world makes it as easy as this country does for you to own a piece of it. And the time really has never been better. And you know what? I know that you probably hear that and, and you wonder, you hear it from people in the real estate business. You hear, now's a great time to buy. That's what they always say. We, they said it in 2005 and 2007 and it wasn't true. Well, it's true now. And what I want to walk you through now is what I call the five principles of real estate wealth. My background is I've been in this business for over 20 years. I've done it all. I've run a mortgage company. I've run a real estate company. I've run a commercial real estate company. I run an investment practice. When I say I've run them, I've started them all up and created them to a level of success um, and then exited them all so that I can get into where I'm, what I'm doing now, which is trying to show you how this moment in history is so incredibly important for you to grab your guts and do something about it if you have the ability. And so the five principles of real estate wealth I've learned over a couple of decades of watching professional investors, mostly in commercial real estate, how they use their creativity, how they use their gut instinct, uh, and then reverse engineered all those patterns and apply them to you. So I wrote a book. The book is called Crash Boom. It's all about after one comes the other, right? After the crash comes the boom. I know this. You know this. Why do we forget this all the time? You know, why does the world forget that after crash comes boom? And by the way, after boom is probably going to come crash. So how do you do this right so that you play the cycles right and don't wind up getting hurt by the downsides? The very first principle is timing is everything. Professional investors know there's a time to buy, there's a time to hold, there's a time to sell. And guess what they're doing right now? They are buying. 35 to 55% of all the home sales in Florida, Arizona, Nevada, and parts of California are cash investors right now. Professionals who are sitting it out during the boom. All right? The guys and gals that I know who are, I mean, they're ridiculously wealthy. You never heard of any of them, okay? They're just quietly sitting on 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars that they've built because in 02, 03, 04, they were buying, they stopped. 05, 06, they dumped everything. They've been waiting on the sidelines. There's enough blood in the water right now, and they're jumping back in again. And I mean in a big way. They're not even wasting time getting mortgages. They're plowing their cash into buying these things for cash because they know that the opportunity right now is incredible because of all the things we talk about here. This unreal foreclosure situation that is driving prices below the trend line. Real estate has a trend line, 3 to 4% a year appreciation nationally. Most markets are going below that right now. That's when you buy. So timing is everything. Principle number two is buy to hold. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say never flip, but people who buy to flip never ask themselves simple questions like, well, what could I rent this for if I can't flip it? And they find out too late that they can rent it for two grand a month, but their mortgage payment is three grand a month, and so they're screwed. You never buy to flip. You buy to hold, even if you're going to flip. You always want to buy a property that if you get stuck holding the, you know, what's the analogy? If you get stuck, the music stops and you don't have a chair, right? If you get stuck holding the hot potato, you want to be able to get a tenant in there and then ride the cycle out. So timing is everything, and in order to make that timing work for you, you buy to hold. Principle number three, cash flow equals staying power. This is important because a lot of people say cash flow is the only thing. Cash flow meaning my rental income covers my expenses. Obviously, that's a very important thing, a very good thing. But there are lots of properties 
that I've seen investors buy, and I've done it myself, that were actually money losers in the beginning, but because they saw something in that property that could be changed, could be improved. One of my favorite stories is I bought a house that was three bedrooms in a den. Well, guess what? I made it a four bedroom, increased the rent, positive cash flow. I bought it as negative cash flow, made it positive cash flow because I recognized the fact that four bedroom houses in that town rent for about 20 to 25% more. And by the way, they sell for 20 to 25% more also. And so I was able to realize equity in the property and make it positive cash flow because I was creative. <clears throat> so cash flow equals staying power. And you can see, Laura, how these things build on each other, right? Timing is everything. But in order to get the timing working for you, you have to buy to hold. And in order to be able to hold, you have to have cash flow. Mm -hmm. All right. The fourth one is the biggie, and that is appreciation equals wealth. There are some folks that will tell you that appreciation is a bonus. You can't count on it. Those people are idiots. Okay. The people who build wealth in real estate time their purchases correctly and buy in the right places so they can... They feel they can count on. There's never any guarantees in this world. But if you want to look at the historical record, housing in most major markets in this country, in all major markets with the exception of Detroit, have gone up in every 10-year period since they've been measuring it after the Great Depression. So you can count on appreciation if you're smart about what you buy and smart about when you buy. And that's why we focus so much on this show like we have in the last few segments on show me a place that's getting beat up but has good long-term population growth. This is not rocket science. People want to live under a roof. People want to live in America. If you own quality housing in America, you're going to be able to have demand to rent that place. Harvard has a, uh, a, it's called the Harvard Center for Joint Housing Studies. And they come out with a survey every year. The, uh, The director of that division has been on this show, probably will be on again this summer, to talk about his most recent survey. And the conclusion that his study came to was that rental rates are too high. Rental rates are too high. Now, the purpose of the survey was to talk about the nature of our housing problem in this country, that we have people that are losing homes, people that can't afford the homes they have, and people that are now going into the rental market and the rental rates are too high. That's good for investors, (laughs) okay? When rental rates are considered to be too high, That means that they're trying to convince the federal government to make some programs for housing affordability. But at the end of the day, the demand for rentals is at an all-time high. The demand for rentals of houses is at an all-time high. That's one of the things the Harvard study found is that vacancies in big buildings is actually up. So while a few million rental households have been created as homeownership has come down, at the same time, they're not moving into apartments. They want to rent houses. You should buy those houses. So appreciation equals wealth, and you can use your creativity to look around the country, look around your community, find reasons to have confidence in future upside, and then once you do that, once you do that, you focus on finding an ugly duckling. We'll talk about that in the next show, how to find an ugly duckling that everybody else is walking right by, that you can buy, dress it up, clean it up, and realize more value there. The fifth uh, principle is real estate is a business. Real estate investment is a business. It's an entrepreneurial pursuit. It's fun. It's creative. It is not passive. But if you're the kind of person who thinks you have the goods, you have a good brain, you have good intuition, you like to do research, you can make a mint doing this right now. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope the show was useful to you. Come and see me at ownamerica.com. Email me at greg at ownamerica.com. And uh, check us out on wabcradio.com. All of our shows are on the podcast section of that site. And we are very, very happy you were here listening to us. This is Greg Rand, Rand on Real Estate. <laughs> yes, it is. And you still have a minute left. I still have a minute left? That's okay. <laughs> no, you guys normally see I have to pull you back because you just keep on going. But yeah, Laura time. goes nuts in here. When I start actually getting close to the end of the show, Laura starts waving her hands around like crazy. I figured I'd save her from the trouble of throwing her shoulders out of joint. But I guess we're... And to make it worse, you videotape the whole thing and people <laughs> yes. will get to see how crazy I look. But anyway, also brought to you today by Own America. Very grateful for that. Greg Rand, you're a, an absolute wealth of information. I feel like like I need to go out like right now and scour this country and find something great. I feel like I can do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyway, this is uh, also we're uh, coming up on Living Better with Laura Smith. I have Dr. Gluck in the house. He is your resident life coach, executive life coach and hypnotherapist. We want to help you fix whatever is going on in your life. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Living Better with Laura Smith. Hope you're enjoying your day today. 77 WABC right back at you.